All right, today we are going to learn about the fall of the Roman Empire. We have two daily objectives. Number one, list Roman and Greek influences on modern culture. And number two, explain theories on the fall of the Roman Empire. So, there are a lot of different causes or potential causes for the collapse of the Roman Empire. And I'm going to try to go through all of the big important ones in this slideshow. Um, but again, there's a lot, so just try to get them down as quickly as you can. So Rome had conquered the valuable lands which it had sought, and it had reached its greatest size. Unfortunately, remember that the citizens of Rome no longer wanted to be soldiers, so it became the poor of Rome. And then eventually the poor didn't even want to be soldiers. So the Roman Empire, under the emperors, had to start hiring mercenaries. A mercenary is someone who is fighting for you as a soldier in an army solely for money that's all they care about is money not patriotism not nationalism not because they want to protect their city or country or whatever but because they want money that's why they're doing it so rome is hiring mercenaries second big thing centuries of war has destroyed farmland much of the farmland has been over farmed they had not invented things like crop rotation that could make sure there was lots of nutrients in the soil pirates and raiders were constantly attacking rome's borders which disrupted trade. And finally, in an effort to save its economy, Rome had devalued its currency by minting coins of less and less silver, silver and gold. This caused inflation. Inflation is when you have too much money chasing not enough goods. If I gave everybody $100 today and they went and bought something, it would not increase the amount of goods. Not everybody would be able to buy all of the same goods because there's only a finite amount of goods which is only really going to increase the price of the goods you can see why this is a problem so inflation is one of the major causes along with mercenaries of the collapse of the roman empire so people this was not inevitable the collapse of the roman empire was not inevitable and in fact the emperors did lots of different things to try and save the empire the first thing that's going to happen is emperor diocletian is going to split the empire in half in 240 CE. Diocletian took the eastern half, and then he co-ruled the west. Um, so the Roman Empire is split into Eastern Roman Empire, which is purple, and Western Roman Empire, which is orange. The interesting thing about the Eastern Roman Empire is that Rome is not even in it. Um, its capital is a city known as Constantinople, which is in modern-day Turkey. Um, and is both Turkish and Greek origins. So Diocletian actually retires as emperor in 305. He was tired. He had enough. And the empire descends into chaos in civil war. By 311, the empire is actually split into four parts. It is split into four parts. Um, Constantine, the emperor of this part over here, um, claims the claim the West, Western and Eastern empires himself, um, and actually reconquers the whole thing. So for a short period of time, the Roman Empire has been reunited in one empire, and in 330 he moves the capital from Rome to Constantinople. So the capital of the entire empire is in Constantinople for a short period of time. But this doesn't last either. Upon Constantine's death, the empire is once again divided in east and west. Um, and this is when things get ugly. So climate change, you've probably heard about climate change. You may have heard the phrase global warming. Regardless of whether you believe that climate change is um, done by man or not, climate change is absolutely a thing that happens on Earth over time. Um, the debate is whether, again, do CO2 emissions have any effect, any impact on climate change? And that's not the point of this class. But do know that climate change is a real thing and that it has huge historical implications. One of those implications are the Huns. So the Huns are a group of people that live in Central Asia. And it gets really, really cold all of a sudden because of climate change. And because of all of the cold, they can't grow crops anymore, which means they're not eating so they get on their horses and they move, because that's what you do when you can't find food. You find food somewhere else. So they move. They start moving into Germany. Germany has not been conquered by the Roman Empire. It's filled with barbarians, quote-unquote. And the Huns are beating back the barbarians, and the barbarians are getting on their horses and they're moving. And they move into 
the Roman Empire. So the Western Roman, the Western Empire is unable to field an army that can stop the barbarians and eventually the Huns. They keep moving until the Huns are even attacking the uh, uh, Western Rome and Eastern Roman empires. Um, the East has its own problems. That is Arabs in the South. Um, so they just start paying the Huns and the other barbarians. They're like, hey, Huns, um, you could attack us or we can give you money and you can go attack the West instead. So that's what happens. In 444 BC, or I'm sorry, CE, Attila unites the Huns into one giant Hun army, 100,000 strong, and he attacks lots and lots of, of Roman cities. So he starts out in the eastern half of the empire. He sacks 70 different cities. Remember that sack is when you find a city and you take it over. Um, he fails to take Constantinople. Um, the Eastern Roman Emperor actually again pays Attila and his large army of Huns to go west instead, and he arrives in Italy in 452. He threatens the city of Rome, but Attila dies in 453 before he could actually conquer the city of Rome. However, the invasions continue, and in 476, the last Roman Emperor, a 14-year-old, that's you, named Romulus Augustulus, is ousted by Germanic barbarians. So the Western Roman Empire officially collapses in 476 CE, and this is going to usher in what is generally called the Dark Ages. Uh, the eastern half of the empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, is going to continue for a thousand more years. They're going to last until the 1440s, um, until they are finally destroyed by the Ottoman Empire. And we will talk about that in Unit 2. This is a picture of Constantinople. With This is the Hagia Sophia, which we'll talk about again when we get to Unit 2. So the Roman Empire and the Greeks, which they kind of copied, are generally they considered the roots, quote-unquote, roots of Western civilization. Western civilization is anything, anybody in Europe or the United States or Canada, any of the countries that, that Europe has founded. Um, so a lot of the things that the Romans and the Greeks created were copied and improved upon by Europeans and then ultimately us, the Americans. Um, so under the Roman Empire, hundreds of territories, including all of Europe, Anatolia, North Africa, were, wo were woven into a single state or country, and all of these provinces were ruled the same way with Roman laws. Um, each province is educated in the classical Greek style, taught Greek art, architecture, literature, and philosophy. Um, Rome had actually conquered Greece in 200 BCE and greatly admired Greek culture, which is why they're copying the Greeks. Um, both the Romans learned Greek, were educated by Greeks, and paid for Greek art. Um, the mixing of Greek and Roman culture, the Romans copied the Greeks and improved upon it, is ultimately going to be known as Greco-Roman culture and is spread by the elites throughout the empire, from London and England all the way to Alexandria and Egypt. Latin, the language of Rome, is going to remain the lingua franca, so the language that everybody learns and everybody speaks, um, until 1700s. And over time, Latin is going to evolve into modern-day French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, and Romanian. These are called the Romance languages because of their Roman heritage. Um, notice English is not on this list. English actually comes out of German more than anything. Um, over here on the right, we get this great chart, which kind of shows us a lot of the things um, how they were created by Greeks or Romans, and then how they apply nowadays. So if we look 509 BCE, uh, Rome developed a form of representative government, one of the first republics. Um, in the 400s BCE, Greece implemented a direct democracy. In the 1600s, England becomes a constitutional monarchy. In 1776, the United States declares independence and creates a republican democracy that we know of and live in today. So we can see how government has moved across time from Greek and Roman, Roman roots to modern-day America. If we look at philosophy, Aristotle develops his philosophical theories in Greece in the 300s. In the 1200s, Thomas Aquinas, this is a European um, theologian, so a guy who talks and reads a lot about the Bible, um, weaves some of Aristotle's ideas into Christian religion. 1781, philosopher Immanuel Kant is going to write um, that Aristotle's theories on logic are still valid and apply them to the modern world. 
And then to, even to this day, scholars still read Aristotle. I've read as Aristotle. A lot of your teachers have read Aristotle. If we look at literature, Homer wrote the Odyssey in 800 BCE and 19 BCE. Virgil uses the Odyssey as a guide to write his Aeneid, which is an epic poem that is very similar. Um, in 1922, James Joyce patterns his epic Ulysses after Homer's work. Homer's work. And in 2000, the film, O Brother, Where Art Thou, is largely based off the Odyssey. So we can see how Roman and Greek culture has moved over the ages and is still influencing us today. If we look at architecture, um, many of Rome's buildings uh, were made of stone, including the aqueducts and the Colosseum, and they exist to this day. This is actually one of the Roman aqueducts in Italy that's still around. Um, Roman architecture, if you think about white buildings with columns like the White House, the Supreme Court building, um, all of these buildings are based on perceived Roman architecture. Um, Rome's roads, her greatest inventions, and her greatest constructions are still in use today. They've been paved over a bunch of times, but they're still in use um, by the countries in Europe. And then Rome's forts uh, became the capitals of Europe. Paris, London, Madrid, these were all big forts created by the Romans before they were capitals of European countries. And then most importantly, probably the most important other than government, is Roman law. Um, some of the most important principles um, that are in our Constitution, uh, like equal treatment under the law, like innocent until proven guilty, were actually created by the Romans that we have copied. And this is the U.S. Supreme Court building. This is a great example of Roman architecture. We see the pyramid, this is or the, the triangle. This is called a frieze. Uh, we've got columns. We've got the big staircase. Great example of Roman architecture into the modern day, even to our government in Washington, D.C. Take a few minutes, answer your two daily objectives.